he has as well. Yeah. <laughs> what I tend to do in the morning, time, Clive will say, what are you up to now, Annie? And I'll go, give me five minutes and I'll tell you what I'm doing. And then, I, then I'm doing things like this. We usually get out about three days a week. The Alzheimer's Society are brilliant. They do, we do a lot with them. And it turns out that this is my, show, my social life nowadays because I can't go out otherwise. I can't leave her alone. We're getting to know a few people on the group. And uh, there's some lovely people on this group and they come along regularly. It's just nice to meet people, you know, it's just nice. She came from Romania, it named her Lisa, L-I-Z-A, and I didn't like that. So I googled Romanian girls' names and the closest was take the Z out for L-I-A Leah and underneath it said bringer of good news. I thought that'll do. Yeah, she's a lovely dog. She really is, she's so soft, she's gentle, she comes back to you when you want to if I go, shh, try and go, shh, and I end up giggling, and she comes back. <laughs> You're having your gammon steak later, aren't you? Am I? <laughs> yeah. You're going to eat all of that? That's a big, that's a big task, that is. I was going to say, we've uh, just done very well. Cool. A whole steak you won't want to eat for two weeks. No. It's really easy to blame dementia and then not notice the positive bits of this new person. That, that, and yes, I missed my mum, but I did try really hard to get to know this, this new person that was emerging through this disease. People say it's like looking after a child, and they say, well, in some ways, yes, but whereas a child will learn something new every day, something with dementia will forget something every day so that they're losing more and more of their brain power yeah. and eventually the brain stops telling the body how to function. I try to take mum out on a journey every day or go and have a coffee at a, a supermarket to try and keep her happy. But the social aspect is lacking there because you don't know anybody in a supermarket restaurant. But you do know socially people in these groups because you see them over and over and over again. So you, you get form friendships or people know you by sight, which counts for an awful lot. And then a natter. Mum loves a natter, don't you, Mum? Uh, oh, it's a steep. It's going to be steep. Yeah. I don't think I could, unless you were here, I don't think I could walk up that steep. And sometimes she remembers that she's been here, you know. Sometimes the memory locks in, sometimes it doesn't, you know. That's the way it goes. Sometimes when we've been out with most of these people here and they're, they're quite happy with what they're doing but at the same time they don't look enough to say that could have been something totally different. It's there for us, for when we need it. And she comes and Leah comes back. She always comes back, always comes back. Clive's not as good as that, but Leah is. I plonk her in front of the TV while I get on with other things, but I can't really leave the room or she'll follow me. She's, not, she's behind me every... She doesn't, I can't leave her on her own. She's anxious. Um, and it's, so it's frustrating, but you just have to let it go because the only, the, only per, the only person that anger will affect is me, not her. She'll forget everything in a couple of minutes. I'll carry the anger, so there's no point in it. I just don't do it. Don't get angry. My husband and I were in that very interesting part of the dementia journey that carers have, which I call the is she, isn't she moment. Okay, so um, there were things that when my mum would do, and I think that's a bit strange. And then she'd be the mum that I knew very well instantly. And I think, well, that was a bit strange that I even thought that. And slowly those is she or isn't she moments got closer and closer together. But that took five years of her living independently near us. And then one day I dropped her off at home and she said, I'd like to talk to you about if ever I got dementia. And I said, OK, then do you want to talk to me now? And she said, yes. And she did this very lovely little plan. 
but evidently she'd been thinking about it. So I, we then had a game plan. So at this point there's no diagnosis at all, but it enabled me to begin to think mum thinks she has dementia. You, you don't know at first, there's no way. You can only tell, you can only look back at a later date and sort of think, ah, yes, that's when it started. That was when the little changes occurred. And for Anne, I think it was probably about eight years ago. And at that time, the little things were just, were just annoying because I had no idea what was going on. And it was silly little things. We'd be driving down the road and she'd say, oh, I saw that person the other day, oh, that's that person. And I have a piece of, but we've never driven down this road before and we're miles from home and you've never seen that person before. And that was a regular thing that she was doing. My mother-in-law passed away exactly three years ago on Sunday. She was diagnosed with dementia probably about seven years before she passed away. We found it quite hard. I was left feeling so hopeless. I didn't know where to go for help. I didn't know what to do. And if I'm struggling so much, how would it be for others who didn't have the language, who didn't have the information at their fingertips? And also dealing with the stigma on the labelling of dementia. And that made me realise just how little people understood what dementia was. All the caring that we'd done for my mother-in-law really was just like a trial run for me. <laughs> because now my father and his dementia is so different and his, the way he's behaving is so different. It's heart disease and you know, or you've got diabetes or, or another condition which, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not minimising any other conditions, but with the brain it's, it's just so different. You just don't know how people are going to cope or how it's going to be affected and how your personality changes. And you know, now I find myself really grieving. I actually was telling somebody yesterday that I, I'm grieving because my father's not a person. I've lost him. I'd like to take my mum more of those gatherings, but there's only so much you can do in a week before you wind yourself down. Because mm. I'm, I'm sole carer, so you know you've got to be careful you don't wear yourself into a into a hole uh, trying to cater for these things. But um, any anything well, like you're this, you're obviously doing really well, Adam. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that, but I'm doing, I'm trying. <laughs> very trying, aren't I, Mum? Oh. Very trying. Oh, very trying. But you get on well. I can tell that that you have a good friendship. Oh, but. she's always hitting me. She is <laughs> always hitting me, and she kicks me, and it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure you And she all she this. steals all my pocket money. She's been into care three weeks in the last four or five months. Uh, because I'd had a motorcycle accident and I couldn't look after her. I was the one who was upset about leaving her. I felt like I'd betrayed her. But she was absolutely fine. And she enjoyed it. And when the last, she was there a couple of weeks ago. And when I went to pick her up, she was in no hurry to come with me. She was having a nice time. So that's a relief that she can... And of course, because her memory span is only a few minutes, time means nothing to her. So an hour, a day, a week, they're all the same. So that even if she's been somewhere for a week, we get in the car, drive down the road, a few minutes down the road, she's forgotten she's even been there. So it's... And she's quite happy when she's there. It's just the ducks around here. They're lovely. It's great, isn't They're it? They're lovely, the ducks. Yeah. Yeah. The ducks. Yeah. Ducks, the ducks, the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> I only have one regret about my mum's dementia, and that was that I didn't talk about going into care a year earlier. Um, so we kept mum at home until we were all frazzled. And my daughter was graduating. We hadn't been on holiday for 10 years or so. And I told my mum in the January that we were going to my daughter's graduation and we would have to put things in place now so that when we got to July, there was somebody else that could do what me and my husband did. And we got to the week of going to the graduation and on the Monday I said to her, it's Wednesday mum, I'm going away for four days and I will be back on Monday. 
but I'm going to Rosie's graduation. And we had come to the point of having to be quite clear that I did need to do that. And there was a flicker in her eye that I could see she didn't believe I would go. And then on the Tuesday morning, she suddenly believed I would go. And on the Wednesday morning, she was wandering down the high street in her nighty. And I think there was some autonomy still left that in that point she was thinking she's actually going to go away for four days and I don't want that and she gave in to it so by a, a, an odd sequence of events I knocked on a care home door which I wouldn't advocate as a way of choosing a care home but the universe was with me and it was the right door and um, I, I said to the home manager oh um, my mum might need a care home one day could I come and have a look around? And she very gently showed me round. And then at the end of showing me that round, sat me down and said, so what's happening for you today then? And I burst into tears and went, I don't know what to do about my mum and I want to go to my daughter's graduation. And she said, right, well, you bring her here for a week's, week's respite. That's what you do. And you come back this afternoon and you tell your mum she's having a holiday too and we'll work from there. And so in a very bizarre hour I went back to my mum and I said mum would you like to go on a holiday too and she said yes and we packed a bag and I took her to the care home and I turned up on the following Monday to take her home and she just turned around to me and said but I'd have to leave all my friends I don't want to go home this is my home and that was it my mother-in-law we had an experience where we needed to place her in a, in, a, in a nursing home for some respite and one night we got a phone call, she'd only been there I think a night and one night we got a phone call saying um, we needed to come out because you know things that something had happened so we got there and we found that she didn't want to be there, she was really frightened and because she couldn't speak any English, she couldn't communicate with any other staff um, she was getting chest pains, I think it must have been anxiety yeah. she didn't know how to tell anybody and um, we were told we'd have to take her away it was awful and we also know that people that have got dementia even if they do speak English, they can lose languages that they've learned so people do revert back to their original language that they, they spoke because they can, they can forget mm. any languages that you've learnt later on in life. Mm. And so we had, we had that with my father, it was around um, food, um, the halal meals, and needing to eat halal food, and being fed all sorts of things which were not halal. Although we had told the, the, you know, the nursing home, because my father again was in a respite bed, um, whilst his care package was being um, organised. So they had, there were issues there, he refused to eat anything. And he was in there for five months. So every day, for lunch and dinner, we'd have to take his food in for him because he wouldn't eat anything from there because he just didn't trust them. It's a beautiful day too. Yeah. The weather's just right, isn't it? It raises mum's spirits, her emotional level. That's what it's all about, otherwise, Depression takes over and then you're just fighting the bad stuff all the time. We've, we've had a pretty horrible year, but you know, we're, we've come through somehow. Obviously, I can talk to other carers and spouses, and you know, we can sort of um, empathize, if you like, knowing that we're, the same things are happening to other people. Because, uh, you, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that think, oh, I'm on my own with this, and it's, what do I do? Whereas if you meet other people that are in the same position, you can swap notes and you can help each other by signposting. So well, have you tried phoning these people, talk to them, see if you can get some help here, there, everywhere else. Well, maybe it was a surprise for you that this became your life in um, a way, was it? Or no, no, I always saw my path going down that way anyway. Uh, somebody had to look after mum and dad. The real shot was dad passing last year. I didn't see that coming at all and we're only just coming to grips with that. But we've, mum's done incredibly well through, throughout the year. Uh, absolutely, she's very, very resilient. And I just plod on as best I can. Just plod on and yeah. hope for the best, really. Well, I have some people coming next week from, for an assessment for residential care full-time. 
because it's just getting too much for me to handle now. So, um, you know, the time, I always sort of said if she became incontinent, I wouldn't be able to deal with that. And that's happened in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, it's time for someone else to take over. could see it was right for my mum, she was safer, it was right for my family. I still then plummeted and thought I've put my mum in a home. And I think a very generous act we could all learn from it is not ever to say to our children don't put me in a home. Even if it's what we feel, don't say it to our children because we don't know what everybody's needs are going to be. Mm. We really don't know. And once we've said that out loud, our children carry that. And they might have to think about different ways of caring for us. Um, so I am on a mission that I would never say, I'm not sure I would like to live in a home, but I'm never going to say it to my children because it might absolutely be the best thing for me at a moment in time that I can't envisage at the moment. A lot of the care homes, um, staff seem to think they don't get very many people in from our communities because the sort of um, the notion is or the assumption is that we look after our own so therefore we don't need care homes or we don't need places in care homes and yes to an extent we do because within particularly the Muslim faith looking after your parents is a really um, honor, honorable and a privileged role um, and it's very rewarding and even in the Quran you know you're ordained to God has said that um, look after your parents you know it's, it's, a, it's a duty to take care of them but saying that you know families try their best and for the same reasons that somebody else's family may need to eventually say okay I can't deal with this anymore um, they need to go into a home change for me. I mean, my routine, my life is geared towards seeing to Anne's needs all the time. That's my role in life at this time. So once that's gone, then I've got to readjust and start again. And I've got plenty to do. It's not like I'm going to be lost or anything. I've got lots to do. I've got people to go and see that I haven't been able to see for a long time. Family, catch up. And maybe have a bit of a social life as well. And maybe get him back into playing in a band. I can still go and see her well, maybe every day if I want to. I can take her to the things that we still that we always do, the memory walks, the memory cafes, the singing groups, and have some quality time with her and not have to deal with the bad stuff. We don't have the choice because the, what we have out there currently isn't really suitable. So, whereas somebody else would be going around looking at suitable homes and looking at, you know, going through the tick list that you want as a family for your loved one, we don't really have that. The first thing we would be looking at is that will the religious and cultural needs be met? Is there anybody there that can speak the language? Will the staff be able to accommodate and understand if, you know, uh, what this person needs, what is important to them, how will they be able to fulfill that, do they know what halal is, do they know that they need to be washed and kept clean and when you worship you've got to be in a state of cleanliness, you can't have any impurity or soiling on our clothes. So these are the sorts of things that you know we would need to be looking at, whether staff within homes are, are, are all going to be sympathetic and understanding and sensitive and so um, it's difficult. If there was a home that was within the local community's vicinity, having your staff to reflect the diversity of the communities, ongoing training and just just compassion and, and understanding and not being resistant. She had three and a half glorious years. Her first year there was a real uplift, she got better and she loved it. Um, 
and then as her care needs changed and the, the dementia journey took her down, losing many of her skills, there the care home was to catch her. And I can always remember the, the, the home manager saying to me, when we'd signed the paperwork for her to live there permanently, gently saying to me, you can be her daughter now, you can stop being her mum. And that was like a gift to stop being my mum's mum anymore. Um, and and mum had got to the stage where she was calling me mum. So we, th what the care home gave me was, um, and gave mum, was um, a theatre to be as we had been before. She was safe, she was happy. <laughs> Firstly, I was like lost. I was like, well, what do I do now? But, you know, I've been so used to looking after her. You know, obviously, the first few days I kept looking around for her. And I've adjusted now. I've sort of got used to the idea. And I'm quite all right. I've started working again, part time, you know, the odd days here and there, which is a necessity, but also gets me out of the house. <coughs> uh, just some lorry driving, basically. She went, went in on the 22nd. 22nd of December? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a very upsetting day, obviously. It was very difficult. Not so much for her, because she didn't know until, you know, the last moment. She did, you know, because of, because of um, her condition, she wasn't, wasn't aware of what was going on. And uh, her daughters helped me, and we took... Um, Lots of her familiar things round to put in the room, in her room. So we had it prepared before, but there was a bit of a, a mix up at the home. Um, and there were no managers there when we got there. So they uh, didn't even have a room ready at the time. So we were waiting around. Anyway, we got it sorted out. So then um, I took her into the room and then told her that this is where she was going to be staying because I could no longer look after her on my own. And I, and yeah, I was upset. Um, but she was sort of, uh, you know, don't worry, don't worry. And she was fine for a couple of days. But then she suddenly dropped off. Now, I've been sort of told by several people this often happens when someone goes into care because it's, one, it's a change of environment. Uh, and two, up until that point, uh, she was here with me and had one-to-one -one care 24 hours a day. Going into a home, she doesn't have that one-to-one -one care and there are lots of other people there. So she, she sort of, she went downhill quite rapidly. I mean, you can also sort of, in the living room, you know, it's all the pictures I put up on the wall for her. Reminder of things, family, friends, events. It sounds quite a negative thing, but what I would pass on is that you can't make it better, so don't try to. I lost the district nurse, bustly midwife lady. I lost that lady. But she didn't disappear from view. She became something else. She became somebody with a sense of humour. Um, she became somebody that was actually gentler. She became somebody who was at peace not to bustle about all over the place. Come on. Oh. We're going the wrong way, aren't we? We're going the wrong way, darling. Yes. <laughs> Come on, then. Yes. There is a big change in her. She lost stone in weight in three weeks she's uh, not eating properly she's lost all her mobility she's lost her balance yeah well, that's your blue blanket it needs two people to take her to the toilet so i wouldn't be able to cope with her on my own anyway now just hold on a second just hold on to that a second I mean, yeah i know i know yeah, i don't want you to fall over again it's only the once well actually we have a once is enough though isn't it <laughs> i don't want you doing it again who is do not want you to fall over anymore. She's sitting quite a long time during the day in, in her chair. Um, I had to ask them for a pressure cushion because she was getting sore through sitting. Okay. Well done, then. Huh? 
They are good in the home, don't get me wrong, they're very good. The people there are wonderful. But the problem is they don't have enough staff. And he's uh, being left sat in a chair most of the time, not being stimulated or exercised. Um, and I've been going in every day, or virtually every day, to at lunchtime to, 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 to feed her because she's not eating properly. You probably had some Weetabix for breakfast, mm -hmm. did you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what's on the menu for lunch. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what you can have for lunch today. All mm -hmm. right? Have you eaten anything? I've, I brought a sandwich with me like I normally do. Oh, I see. She's chewing a mouthful of food, sometimes for 20 minutes. So trying to get her to swallow, she's, it's, the message isn't getting through. There are some changes. She tends to talk through her teeth now that she didn't do before. There are little moments when there are little flashes of the old arm, but they're brief and few and far between now. I think I've got the bottom half upstairs, actually. The bottom half of what? What have you got? The bottom half of what is upstairs? Just let me just go and have a look and see if there's anybody up in the, front, the, the, the house. Well, there's not. No, the house, there's nobody in the house at the moment. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there's upstairs here, but mm -hmm. that's other people living up there, isn't it? Is it? And then the care staff, mm -hmm. they look after you, mm -hmm. don't they? Huh? No, I, I, love, I love people singing with you. I know. Well, you do some singing here. Did You did some singing yesterday afternoon, I think, didn't you? When mm -hmm. I left, they took you upstairs for some singing. Sounds lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes I can get it, get it away straight away just like that. But, it, it, but at the same time, I can get away with it. Mm. And I don't like leaving people lost if you like if you know what I mean. <sighs> we have to honour care staff by how limited their time is. So to not think that lack of time means you can't achieve things. And I would, as a member of, of a care team, um, suggest that care workers do simple micro little things like saying to a son that comes to visit Give me three things that describe your mum. And they might say, well, if I was talking about my mum, I'd say, in charge, um, a tender soul with a very strong faith, with beautiful blue eyes. Those are, those are things that come to the fore. So immediately you've got, you've got that bridge of, of saying, oh, right, OK, so she's got a really strong faith. So immediately there's a moment in a difficult section where you could say, you could say to my mum, what's your favourite hymn? Or where did you used to go to church, Ruth? Or you were a midwife, weren't you, Ruth? All you've done is, is in 30 seconds asked a family member for three things that might give you a little grappling hook on those days when conversations are difficult. It's a lot better though, it was black the other day, wasn't it? What, yeah. Your finger. Remember yeah, yeah. finger back, Ruth? <laughs> don't you stop, because yeah. I don't want to do anything hard. If you have to choose a home, then it couldn't really do much better. Um, so yeah, like I say, and the staff are nice. And, and it's actually, I've sort of, um, because I spend a lot of time there, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I talk to all the staff, know them all by name, the residents that are on her wing, 20 of them, you know, in much the same situation as I am. But there's still people and I talk to them and call their names and say hello to them and I don't they don't really know me but I think I may be familiar in a way to some of them now because I'm there every day. But I don't know for sure. But uh, there's not a lot of interaction between resident to resident. They don't really because they're all in their own little world, I suppose. I always asked my mum a bit of advice every day that I saw her and that immediately put her as lead of the conversation and we even did that when words became a bit muddled and it might be something simple as gee I'm not sure this was the right cardigan today mum what do you think and she'd go like this or she'd go like that <laughs> but immediately she was leading the dialogue I was listening to her opinion up to me whether I took it or not, but it
but it would offer them a little step into another conversation. You haven't got any lunch, darling. Well, lunch will be around in about half an hour, but people start to get ready before that, don't they? Hmm? Yeah, so we'll go across there in a while, mm -hmm. and see so you can have your lunch. Oh, thank you. Before she went into the home, um, I was taking her out sort of three times a week. Now it's really difficult because uh, she, I, I have to take a wheelchair to take her out and I have to lift her into the car and I have to lift her out. Now that's not easy to do. So I basically brought it down to once a week. Mm -hmm. Where are we going? I have no idea. We're going singing for the brain. Mm hmm Singing for the brain. Yeah. You want to do that, don't you? Yeah. You like doing that, don't you? Yeah. These people we love these people that we're caring into their older years were vital 18 year olds, were naughty 12 year olds, were exasperated 30 year olds, <laughs> were hard working mums and dads, were folk that could cycle down a hill with their legs spread out going wee. everybody's dementia journey is an easy path at all and uh, you know my mum was not hallucinating my mum was not angry my mum's personality didn't change to make her violent in any way so it's very easy for me to be saying oh well we look for the happy and you know I should have put her into care a year before so she could have had more fun all of those things I'm talking about a specific lady's journey of dementia but I did learn things about all of dementia, is that we can't decide somebody has come to an end because we no longer recognise the way they are. They are still in existence. They are just existing in a different way. And the journey of being around them is much easier if we start to embrace who they are in that moment of time and react to it than if we're forever wanting the person that we knew before dementia to come back because we can't make it better and they're not going to come back from that. They're still alive and they're still functioning and you still have to enjoy what you can while you can, you know? And up until um, very recently, until she went in, I, you know, I was still enjoying taking her out and she was enjoying going out to the memory cafes, to the singing groups, the memory walks, just going out. She was, you know, it was, she was enjoying it. Obviously she's deteriorated a lot now, which is why she's in care, but I can still, she's still alive, she's still breathing, she's still functioning. I can't write her off yet. She's still my wife and I still care. So you've just got to, life goes on, make the most of it for both of you.